I'm Melissa Willa. I am co-founder and chief clinical officer at Kayo. My husband, Colin Davidian, and I founded Kayo about 15 years ago, going on 16 years. I am a BCBA, and at Kayo, I work very closely with Sage on our clinical integrity, uh, the clinical culture of our agency, um, training, health and safety. Um, so that's become a lot bigger in the past year. And uh, yeah, Sage, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Sage Howard. I am also a BCBA. Um, I am our Senior Director of Clinical Integrity, and I am talking to you guys today because I am also um, our Compliance Officer here at CAIO. So um, we are going to spend the next hour talking about developing and implementing a compliance program for an ABA agency. Um, and I think, you know, just starting us off, um, the, the kind of first thing that I would say is that certainly my experience, and I would imagine everybody on the call, is that is by and large, people are trying to do the right thing. Um, but the reality is, and we at Kyo have had, you know, some personal experiences with this, um, just having good intentions does not make you compliant and you can still find yourself um, in a little bit of a pickle with payers and um, potentially, you know, some federal uh, issues. And so, you know, it's, it's really important, um, we believe, to, you know, put the time and put the resources into developing a really robust compliance um, program for your agency. So we're going to kind of talk about why should you care? What does it matter to, to be compliant? Uh, and then move in to talk about how do we do it? What, what should a compliance plan entail? And we're going to kind of specifically hone in on a couple of the um, elements that we think, you know, really kind of protect your, your agency. And just a little bit more about the Kayo team for folks. We currently serve about a thousand children with family, children with autism and their families. And we're across seven states. We have uh, over 700 employees. Sage and I work um, closely with our clinical supervisors. We have over 80 BCBAs uh, employed at, at Kayo, very talented group. And um, we, we spent a lot of time uh, in compliance a few years ago. We learned a lot and we're happy to share with you um, what we've done at Kayo um, to eliminate a lot of headaches and reduce a lot of risk. Um, and to, to just strengthen our organization. Uh, Sage, when I clicked forward a minute ago, I, I couldn't actually go back. So hopefully uh, we'll only need to go forward in the present. Okay, we're good. <laughs> See if this works. No problem. All right, so what is the problem, Sage? So, I mean, I think at the highest level, the problem is that whether you fell in love with ABA, um, you know, to be a healthcare provider or not. Many of us who have been in the field for a long time did not. When I was, you know, going to school, learning about behavior analysis, I had no thought that it would eventually, you know, fall under this healthcare realm. Um, the reality is that the, the majority of the services that we are providing now are healthcare services. Um, and the healthcare industry is extremely regulated. Uh, there are a lot of rules to follow. Um, you know, you talk about, you know, some of those things that can feel a little scary to talk about when you talk about um, HIPAA and you talk about state and federal mandates um, and then, you know, different provider qualifications. So there's, there's a lot to keep track of, I think, is the big problem. <laughs> we can go on to the next slide. And then on top of that, so we're in this healthcare industry. And then we're behavior analysts. And so as behavior analysts, we have all of these other things to make sure that we are complying with and maintaining. And we have um, our RBTs who need to, you know, maintain their certification. Depending on the state that your agency is in, you may also have licensure for BCBAs and or behavior technicians. And you need to monitor all of those different requirements that allow people to obtain and maintain um, those uh, certifications on top of all of the federal payer state requirements. Next slide. And then, you know, you're thinking about those two things and you think about as your agency grows and likely begins to 
you know, work with a more varied payer mix, which is um, great for the health of your business. Uh, but it means that you just multiply the requirements, right? If, you, if you're currently working with insurance, you know that it is not a one size fits all. They do not all follow the same rules. They may use the same codes and interpret them totally differently. Um, and so the more varied your payer mix becomes, the more requirements you're going to need to find a way to understand and comply with. Um, and when you look at these pie charts, you can see this is you know, a Kaya specific example. On the left there, um, from a, you know, a few years ago in one of our regions, kind of showing what we call our payer pie. Um, so there's six, eight already, you know, a good number of, of requirements to keep straight. Um, and then when you look at that very, very colorful uh, pie on the right, that is, um, I believe in 2020 at the company level, the number of different payers that we are working with. And so it has become very, very important to us to make sure that we have a very clear way to um, learn, understand, and follow each of those payers' um, requirements and expectations. And the reality is non-compliance hurts. Um, it hurts, it can hurt in the clinical care aspect, right? Um, you know, we all would like to believe that, you know, many of the things that, um, uh, especially the payers uh, have implemented are to make sure that clients are receiving the best treatment from qualified providers and receiving the right amount of, you know, supervision and all of that type of stuff. So it, it matters, you know, being compliant matters to make sure that the quality of care that you're providing is top notch. And then it really, really matters from a business perspective um, because if, you know, you can't provide any services if you go out of business because you have had a payer or the government come after you for huge amounts um, of money. So it's, you know, across the board, being compliant is important and really um, pays off for your company. And you can see here, these are just a few, probably these, you know, to some of you guys, these are familiar, but a few sort of headlines over the last few years um, related to kind of increasing crackdown on fraud in the autism ABA um, space. So um, I think if we click forward, we can see all three of them, but you know, we're talking about prison time, $13 million healthcare fraud, technician credentialing for autism therapy is the latest challenge in Medicaid fraud crackdown, executive director of Suburban Autism Center charged with fraudulently billing. Um, and so these, you can see $13 million, like these are huge, huge um, fines that are being levied and, and jail time. And this is not even addressing, you know, what happens when, you know, a payer just comes back to you and says, hey, we think that your last six months or 12 months of services, you know, we actually shouldn't have paid you for, we want that money back, right? So there's a lot of ways where, you can get yourself into, um, into a little bit of a pickle. Um, and so, like Melissa said, a few years ago, we spent a lot of time um, and, and resources and you know, man and woman power and hours um, developing what we you know, think is a pretty robust compliance plan. Um, and I will tell you that I don't know if anybody else is you know, currently working in compliance, but we have gotten in like the last two weeks, like five different audits. Um, and it sounds crazy, but we act, I actually do look forward to them now because I know that we have built a robust enough program that we're going to be able to respond to it quickly. Um, and we, you know, knock on wood, um, are going to, you know, pass the audit. We're going to be able to meet whatever it is they are auditing us um, on. And so I think, I wonder, Melissa, if you have to like click forward to, there we go. Okay. So the office- I was afraid. General, I was afraid to click forward too quickly and then lose it all. But yes, I had a feeling that those were just hidden. <laughs> Sorry about that, Sage. Okay. No, no problem. So they have identified seven elements of an effective compliance program. And I will tell you that if for any reason, the government were ever to come knocking on your door and question you about your compliance in the healthcare field, just being able to show that you have set up systems that address all of these seven, even if they failed miserably and you actually did do something wrong, is going to buy you some goodwill. So I really encourage people to just 
start with these seven. It's kind of a, a really nice way to just organize, like, how do I even get started? What do I do? Um, and so I'll go through really briefly the seven, but you can see those two that are highlighted in blue are the ones that we're going to really spend a little bit of time um, talking about and diving into. And so the first one is the idea of designating a compliance officer. Um, I think I know Melissa and myself have gotten questions like, do, does this need to be a full-time role? Do I, you know, try to get someone who has all this experience in healthcare compliance? Um, I mean, I will say that I had zero experience in healthcare compliance. Kayo um, sent me to a week-long, pretty intensive training on um, healthcare compliance, and I like to think that I'm, I'm doing an okay job. So I encourage people to, depending on the size of your agency, just carve out this position. It may not be a full-time job, especially in the beginning, um, but to just find somebody who can you can kind of give these seven things to and say, hey, can you start to build this out for us? Um, so documenting policies and procedures we're gonna talk about right after this. And then kind of going into that, great if you've documented all of your policies, um, but then you gotta train people. You gotta figure out how are we gonna make sure everybody who needs to get this training, um, otherwise the policies mean nothing and they sit in a drawer and you can pull them out, I guess, and show a payer, we have a policy about this, but if you can't then also document that you've trained people on it, it doesn't mean much. Um, it's really important to develop a culture when you're looking at number four of um, open lines of communication to make sure that people understand we want you to come forward with these questions and concerns, even if it's about yourself and you realize, hey, last month, I, you know, use this code to bill, and now I'm realizing I think I wasn't supposed to do that. You know, we, I think, at Kyo have set up a culture where it's like, great, bring that to us. You know, if you bring that to us, we can correct it. If you realize it and don't bring it to us, it's a little bit more of an issue. But it's really important to set up those ways for people to um, know who to communicate to. We have anonymous um, communication platforms that we have set up, so people who maybe are concerned about a coworker and don't wanna be thought of as a tattletale are able to anonymously report any concerns that they might have. Um, so number five, we're also gonna send a good hey, you know, just before, just time. Just before, yeah. just before you go to number five, I wanna to mention to folks, um, for those of you who are BCBAs who are on the call today, we will be, if you would like a CEU, we, will, we are able to provide that, but you will need to make note of two key words that we're going to give out at, at some at point, um, various points during the talk. So if you, um, you know, we, we, you don't have your video on. So if you're, if you're multitasking at the same time, at least, you know, we, we hope that you find the talk to be extremely informative and interesting, but we know sometimes you may uh, get distracted by a child or something else in the background, but please listen for the keywords. We will be giving out two keywords during the talk. Okay, Sage, go ahead. Perfect. Um, okay, so we are gonna spend a, a, you know, a good amount of time talking about developing um, internal monitoring and auditing processes. So great, you've developed these policies and procedures, you've trained people. Now, you know, probably the biggest part is making sure that the, the things that you have put in place are actually happening. You know, um, things around code usage and, um, you know, whatever policies you have or your payers have that you're gonna build out systems for, you can't just train people and then say, I've trained everybody, they all are gonna do it right. I'm sure they are mostly going to try to do it right, but you do need to have systems set up to make sure that you catch when there are, you know, concerns and, and issues uh, popping up. And then, you know, number six, you have to be prepared to enforce them. And that's going to be different types of enforcement, depending on, you know, what, what happened. Um, certainly there are some types of things that, you know, are, are pretty blatant fraud and, you know, insurance fraud, and, and that would lead that coyote to termination. And then there's other things that would lead to retraining, right? So you, you kind of need to know what is the magnitude of this and how do we respond? And you can see there number seven is it's really, really important to make sure that, especially as a compliance officer, you're not getting these reports in and kind of brushing them off like, oh, it's probably not a big deal. They have to be investigated and they have to be responded to, you know, promptly. Okay, so, you know, the first element that we're really going to highlight is that element number two. So documenting policies, procedures, standards of conduct. Um, there is 
so much to consider when you, you know, figure out what do I need to document? What, what are these policies and procedures that I need to set up? Um, you know, so thinking about what are various rules that we need to follow, and you can kind of go through that hierarchy. Are there state rules that, you know, are governing ABA? Are there federal rules? There are always going to be because we are healthcare providers. Um, are, you know, what are the various payer rules? All of that type of stuff. What is it that I need to document and who am I documenting it for? Again, we don't want to just do it to check off a box like I did this. Now it lives in a drawer, but I can pull out my policy related to whatever it is, fraud, waste and abuse if I have to. You need to make sure that you're tailoring it for your audience and you're presenting the information to them in a way that they're actually going to be able to use it. Um, and then, you know, related to that idea of it not living in a drawer, where will this live? How are the people at your company who need to access this going to be able to access it? How are you going to make sure that they always have um, the most updated version and they don't start re referring to some outdated stuff? So the first thing, right, is before you can make them is you have to understand the rules. Um, so the big, big, big one is we are healthcare. Uh, field now. And we really need to think about things like fraud, fraud, waste and abuse, um, false claims act, anti-kickback statute. There are all sorts of stuff. If you are interested, I'm happy to provide people with the um, name of the organization who I went to to do healthcare um, compliance you know, training. And they will go in depth on this type of stuff. The biggest thing really to know is that if you are taking any type of federal funds, so if you are working like with a, a Medicaid payer, this is governing your practice. And so when you think about things like fraud, um, you know, which is obviously you can read the direction or the description over there, but you know, knowing and willfully executing um, a scheme basically to defraud a healthcare benefit, you need to pay really, really close attention to what is that what does and does not fall under that umbrella? And how does that compare to something like waste and abuse? And then what do I do if I do detect it? You need to have all of those things um, pretty uh, well defined so that you can then go ahead and set up your systems that are going to prevent it. A big, big, big one for us is like we talked about earlier, we work with so many different payers and we do uh, very, very intense reviews of payer contracts. So um, I do hear, you know, a lot of times I'm on different, you know, Facebook groups and stuff. And there are people who just get the contract and they sign it. Um, please don't do that. We, I really, really, really encourage you to take the time to read through the entire thing. Um, ask questions. A lot of times we'll get contracts that will say, this is referenced in the blah, 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 blah policy. We will go back to them and say, hey, where is the blah, blah, blah policy? Oftentimes they, it actually doesn't exist. And they, you know, but don't just sign it. Um, we are not afraid to be a little bit of a thorn in the side of some of the payers in terms of like, we will take our time and we will ask for changes if there's things that we know, like we're not going to be able to meet that requirement. Um, and we have walked away from contracts. We have spent months reviewing them and then said like the amount of work that it's going to take us to comply with all of these little requirements is just, it's not going to be worth it um, for us. So we have a very thorough, you know, ours is like an online tool that we're using where we go through every single type of thing that we wanna make sure that we ask and review for. And until all of that is done and all of the different teams who are impacted um, have signed off and said, I understand what these are. I'm ready to set up the systems to make sure we um, comply with them. We do not um, sign that contract. Um, and so you want to ask questions. So we actually have developed kind of like a standard list that if we don't see this in a payer's contract, we're going to go back and ask them these specific questions. What are the codes that are used? How are they used? Can they overlap? Which codes can and which can't codes can't? Um, you know, who can provide each of the services? Do you need to be credentialed? Do you need to be rostered? We've found in California, a lot of our Medi-Cal payers 
even our BTs have to go through a rostering process. So we need to know that um, so that we can make sure we're only putting people who have been rostered on those Medi-Cal um, cases. Do they require the RBT? Do they require any type of ongoing education? Um, I believe that 100% of Medicaid payers um, do require annual um, compliance slash fraud, waste, and abuse training. So you want to know what is the initial training requirements to work with this payer? Do they require CPR? Do they require, you know, anything like that? Is it annual? Is it once a year? Is it never, you know? Um, what are the clinical, you know, documentation per visit? What do they need to see in those session notes? Um, we spent a lot of time revamping these and the, the approach that we took was we are just going to adopt the most stringent requirements from each of our payers and apply them across the board so that we feel we're pretty well protected because we have kind of at each opportunity taken the most onerous requirement and embedded that into our, um, our policies. Um, and, you know, again, if you have a question, ask. We will send something via email so that we get an answer in writing. We then store that email in a file with the contract so that if there is ever an issue, we can always go back and say, hey, here's the email we got where you said this is actually permitted. And I think I'm going to pass it off to Melissa. All right, and I will give folks the first keyword. Um, the first keyword for your BCBA CEU today is barn. You cannot tell because of my green screen uh, behind me, but I am seated in a barn right now that's been converted to an office up in Sonoma County. Um, so that's your first word, barn. So thank you, Sage. Um, one little aside before we dig into this more in terms of you know documenting policies, I will say one of my biggest words of advice to you, and I hope your team is already at this point, but for any of you who are not, if you are still using paper notes, please, please move to electronic notes. That is one of the biggest things that you can do to help shore up and um, ensure compliance from your clinicians in terms of the content that is required in notes because you can create forced fields such that a clinician can't ever leave a note that doesn't include um, you know, the, who was present during the session. Um, so if it's a supervisor's note, they have to include what the, the follow-up plan is. Um, there are different fields. And then also that this note was left because if you are running an agency and you're relying on paper notes and binders and you can't be out at every client's home and for every session and every BCBA, but you need to know that every single instance of therapy, there's a note documenting what was provided. And so that shift um, years ago when we moved from paper to electronic and then using through Central Reach, uh, the forced requirement fields and requiring notes to be left um, uh, you know, for each visit and supervisor signature, what you can do with electronic notes there is just huge in terms of um, ensuring compliance. When you are writing policy documents, Sage talked about this a bit, but what are some things that you want to consider? First of all, when you're thinking about the policy document, what are the key points? So your payer contract, maybe 50 to 100 pages, what are the key points in that contract that you need to document in a policy for clinicians, if that's your audience? What if your audience is your group of revenue analysts, your billing team? What needs to be documented in a policy for that team? What are the essential points that need to be documented in a scheduling policy for the scheduling team that pertain to um, the payer's requirements? And how will they, the, the audience best understand the policy? If you have multiple payers, are you going to build out a manual that groups by code or by payer? These are all things to consider when uh, generating your, your policy document. Melissa, there's a couple questions. Maybe I could just so oh, don't please. get too far to behind. Do you mind if I them? Okay, yeah, that'd be great. Sure. So I see one question asking, um, what would be the job description of a compliance officer? Um, I think that in the beginning, we actually pulled this, like you can look up what a healthcare compliance officer will do and use that as a template. And as 
you sort of start building out the role and see what it needs in your agency, you can kind of fine tune um, what that what that looks like. So, you know, the overall idea is they are they're really in charge of of developing and monitoring and kind of overseeing your agency's compliance and kind of being proactive and starting to you know identify areas where you need to uh, spend a little bit more time or, or resources in order to ensure your um, compliance. Yeah, and I would add to that, um, if you might start by having your complaint. If you feel like the clinical area is where you want to start, um, you know, re regarding payer policies for clinicians, notes and forms, you could start with your compliance officer digging in there and looking at, you know, writing the policies or rewriting, training, monitoring. But ultimately, your compliance officer can really also add value across the organization in terms of employees adhering to HR policies, um, the, you know, the credentialing team, and um, making sure that there are effective means for monitoring policies related to credentialing, um, you know, billing practices can run across yep. the agency. Many, many mm -hmm. domains. Um, what are some important items to look out for in the payer contract? I think this question may have come in before we, there was a little bit of a list, um, but you know, on top of some of those, like sometimes there's really small things that we will find that are like, you know, you must notify us within 15 days if X, right? Like it seems really little. And at the time you're like, did they, like what is that gonna, that's never gonna happen or they're not really gonna care. I mean, they may not care, we at Kyo have elected to play it very, very safe. And every single one of those, we either go back to them and say, hey, this is why it's not going to be possible for us to do this. Um, and a lot of times what you'll find with them is it's like, they're like, oh, that's fine. Like the language is just there because it's like this standard contract. Um, but I would encourage you to look out for those little things that you otherwise might just like brush off and sort of like, oh, that's so small. It, it doesn't um, matter. Um, and then the last one, in your experience, do payers audit data or will session notes suffice? That's a really good question. Um, we include our data in the session notes. So we have only ever, we have never gotten an audit <clears throat> where they have asked us, I don't believe, to submit our graph, like the actual, um, you know, what you would think of as like the program binder with every graph. Um, but they do require that we have the data that was collected in the note. So if for some reason we didn't have that, they may then come back to us and say, okay, now we want to actually see the data. And Sage, I believe that we export not just the notes, but also, so um, I guess there are two things. One, now the technicians click a button and it includes the data right within their session note, right? But previously there were times during audits where we had to export the learning tree data separately. Yep. Yeah. So we we've uh, we've made our process much more streamlined. But yes, um, you can you know depending on the what system you're using. Um, but yeah, I guess that's that's true. There have been a couple times where we have exported a full you know learning tree or program book to um, send off to a payer. But generally, the audits that you'll get will be. You know, we want every report that's ever been written and we want every session note for these dates and service and they're um, they'll be pretty specific about what it is that they want you to include. Um, just a few other things I can think of in terms of, you know, examples of what to look for with those pair contracts. They might have a clause regarding the number of days or your timeline uh, for which an assessment must be submitted to them for a new new client. And let's say you're an agency that has a timeline of 30 days for an assessment, but a payer in their contract says their their, their timeline is 15 days. You know, you either need to adopt that and change your entire organization's policy to 15 days, uh, or just for that one payer, make sure that your clinicians are educated on that timeline, or decide that that's not going to work for you and not contract with that payer. Um, you need to look for overlap codes. So which codes do they allow to be run simultaneously? Do they allow, um, uh, what would be a good example? Do they allow the, the BT to be delivering direct therapy um, at the same time of supervision or do they only allow you to build the supervision code and absorb the cost within that of the technician's time? Um, 
Do they require that the parents sign off on every note? Little things like that. Maybe they have a vaccine requirement or a you know other type of health testing requirement. Those are all things to to look for. Yeah, we I can just share really quickly. We had recently a very prolonged uh, discussion with a pair who had you know one tiny little clause that said um, you know you can't offshore any client information, um, which we have some developers helping us out, you know, out of the country. They don't store any of the client data, but we were very upfront with them and we told them. Um, and I will say their response was, we know other people do this, but they've always told us they don't. You've told us that you did it. So now, you know, we can't have you. So that became, you know, you do we're very, very um, upfront with the payers and let them, you know, we don't try to be like, they're not going to ever find out. We're going to just sort of like push that through. And ultimately that all ended up fine for us, but it's those little things where you think, and I think probably a lot of um, agencies do just sort of like, nobody's going to catch that. We're going to, we're going to push it through. Um, we feel good knowing that like, maybe they're not, but if they ever do, we know about these requirements and we have set up systems around those. Um, so going back to where should a policy live, then you know your options are it could be a single standalone document, it may be part of a larger manual. We have certain manuals in the company that are multi-page documents, some that are you know almost a hundred pages, um, and uh, it could be put you know in a Google Drive, searchable by staff. Maybe you have a company intranet um, that has various pages organized under clinical and credentialing and HR, um, but you need to think about where it will be most accessible by staff. You got a lot of options there, but the one thing please take away from this, never, never, ever do policy by email. And this is something that we just ingrain in Kyo managers and we always see new managers trip up on this and we provide feedback and we explain why it's not okay. And I'll, and I'll give you some example of uh, what I mean by policy by email. So here's an example and let's talk about what the problem might be. So attention clinical staff, let's imagine that you know we sent this email. Please be advised that as of August 1st, 2021, X payer is permitting indirect work for code 97151. All other codes for this payer must be performed face to face. So can anyone think of what a pro what might come to pass in terms of a problem with sending out a policy by email. Feel free to use the chat if you have any thoughts. Folks aren't sure. I can start to share. Let's see. All right, so I will explain that from our perspective, if you engage in policy by email, it is going to become out of date at some point. And then your clinicians will go back and search through their email and they'll point at, oh, well, you said on such and such a date, this was effective and the payers now changed their policy. They missed another email on it. And now all of a sudden there's a compliance issue. Um, additionally, if you do send emails and we know that that it is okay to have a policy in an email, but it has to attach to a live, a living policy document. So that way, if it is in the email and they go back, it will always go to the current um, version of that, of that policy. So this is a better example. Attention clinical staff, please be advised that of August 1st, 2021, X payer is permitting indirect work for this code. Uh, all of all of their codes must be performed face to face. As a reminder, and we say this as naughty as not <laughs> ad nauseum. As a reminder, the most up to date payer policy information can be found in our ABA Codes 101 manual. Or maybe it's a health and safety policy update that you've emailed about, and you have a link to your health and policy health and safety policy, and you say, as a reminder, the most up to date. Current health and safety policy can be found here on our intranet, or maybe it's to your clients. And you say, as a reminder, our most up-to-date health and safety policy can be found here on our on our on our website. But that will help you a lot, just making sure that staff are 
um, using the most up-to-date information. This is an example of a policy manual at CAIO, a page from a policy manual. And so it's not just one standalone policy document, but rather we have all of our payers rules for clinicians in a very lengthy manual called ABA Codes 101. And we've decided to organize it by payer, but with a super logical flow where there's the it looks, each section will look the same so that clinicians know to expect at the top, they'll always find the code. They'll always find the description of what that code means for that payer, which are the providers are authorized to use that code and what is the billing increment. Um, each section always indicates what overlap is allowed, what is allowed in terms of indirect, um, any tagging that our clinicians need to do. Um, as part of the appointment process, supervision, telehealth, et cetera. Um, this one example put in there a, a little while ago, this one may be potentially out of, out of date uh, from this slide, but the manual that we have is updated every month. Um, and one of the things that we do from a compliance perspective um, in terms of storage of manuals and policy documents like this, um, we every time they're updated, we create a new version and we rename it with the new version, the month, the year, we file away a PDF of that new version. And that is our record. Uh, let's say one of your employees engages in non-compliant behavior, potential fraud at some point, you as an executive with your organization need to be able to prove that you trained and you provided that information on the policy to your staff. Um, and it would be great to have an attendance record too of that that clinician sat in on that training on X date and time. We have um, monthly meetings for all of our clinical supervisors, monthly trainings every month. We, we publish this manual and other, other man, clinical manuals and we're providing them with you know, updates on them. And then we're you know, have, collecting attendance, storing those records um, so that we, we have that on file. Anything you wanna add here, Sage? I see there's a question that says what items on, you know, specifically on ABA Codes 101 are commonly um, updated. You know, we, um, there's not a ton, right? Like we did there in the beginning, it was massive. Every month there was huge amounts of updates. But now it would be, you know, if we're looking at this, if this payer makes a change to their overlap rules, that would be updated here and it would be highlighted in green for people to see. If they made a change to um, their telehealth allowance, that would be updated here, um, highlighted in green for, for staff to see. So anytime we get any updates from a payer related to codes or the way that we can use the code, um, it will be updated in this document. That's right. And to make it easy for staff to reference um, one of the, the little tricks that we use is, is to highlight, as Sage said, that the new information, you know, it's a hundred page manual for staff to go through. They wouldn't know what, what is the most up to, you know, what, are, what is the new information? So we'll highlight it in green. And then the next month, you know, we, that part is unhighlighted. The next update is, is highlighted in green to just for ease of, 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 of finding that um, most, most, most recent updates. So you, once you have your policy document, you need to train key staff also in how to document. So you maybe create a policy template, maybe through Google, that then um, other managers in the company can use and uh, create additional policy documents in the future so that you're not the only one that knows how to generate a coherent policy document. If Sage had to generate all the policy documents for the company, um, you know, she wouldn't be able to have time to, to sleep at night. So we make sure that, you know, our contract manager, our training manager, HR manager, scheduling manager, really department managers need to understand how to document processes and policies in a coherent, clear manner. Um, so they need to think about to whom does it pertain, what's the scope, what procedures must be followed, when should the policy be applied. Here is a, a random example from, from Kayo. 
We have a professional development, allowance, uh, professional development allowance policy for BCBAs. When we put together a policy document like this, just what, what do we need to you know, think about in, in terms of communicating? This is less an example of um, something that would be a compliance risk and more just like how to communicate an effective policy. What Try to think about what are the questions that the staff might have and answer those in your policy document. So who is eligible for this PD allowance policy? What level of approval is required? How much can you get reimbursed? What what do you need for your expenses to be eligible? Um, when when must those expenses be submitted? So one of the other elements we wanted to talk about is conducting internal monitoring because your compliance, you're really only as safe as your monitoring system um, enables you to be. So you can have a wonderful policy document and you can train staff but you can really fall flat if you don't monitor and ensure that staff are adhering to your policies. So you need to be thinking about um, what, what exactly do you want to, to monitor? Uh, there are so many policies that you're going to have for your staff and for your team, and it is not realistic that you're going to be able to monitor everything, one, you know, 100% all, all of the time for um, every employee. So you're probably going to need to conduct some random audits of certain percentages of, of employees in, in each group. Um, and you have to think about for, for your agency, what represents, what do you think represents the biggest risks? And, and think about, you know, attacking those first with your monitoring plan. Um, you're going to want to consider do we think that this is something that needs to be monitored daily, weekly? Is it every occurrence? Is it just monthly or annually? And who is going to be the responsible party for monitoring it? Will it be a compliance officer, a department manager, a consultant? Anything here, Sage, you wanna add? No, I think that is totally right that, you know, in the beginning, it can be overwhelming because there's so many different things that you could potentially monitor. And I think doing that exercise of sort of the risk and, and how Melissa is going to talk a little bit about things that you can automate to set up, right? That's going to require a lot more, a lot less ongoing um, work, but just seeing like what feel like the really big high risk things that we should start with. And then, you know, as you get those, you can start setting up some, some monitoring for kind of nice to have. So here's an example from Kayo. We engage in clinical records monitoring and we um, you know, had to make some determinations about for various records, how often are we monitoring them? What, what is it that we're monitoring? So we monitor both our clinical notes and we also monitor assessments and, and reports. Uh, the clinical notes are monitored at a macro scale monthly, but they're also monitored of course by um, each BCBA is reviewing every note that a technician leaves and signing off on, on those notes. Um, but at a corporate level, we're going through a percentage of those notes on a monthly basis to ensure that they're adhering to our, our requirements. Um, we do a percentage of the clinical notes. We are not at a macro level monitoring every single note. We're looking for um, staff that may need retraining um, and you know, finding that through the percentage, um, and then you know, putting them in a, a retraining if 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 needed. Um, we have a, a a BCBA who on our team works in a clinical integrity capacity who does who performs the the record monitoring. We look at. Um, reports at, at, for one period of time, we had been looking at each instance of the reports. I think Sage, we're now maybe doing a percentage of those as well and no longer doing every instance, um, except we have, um, we, we changed the requirements a bit on this for new staff. So is it new? We have new, new yeah, sorry. New staff have a certain number of reports reviewed prior to submission, um, as well as staff who during that sort of random audit come up as needing a little bit of um, additional support. That's right. So, so for example, Sage, our new technicians, 
they have every note reviewed during their first week or two, right? And then they sort of pass and then we move them on to this random review and they, they go into that, that bucket. And as Sage was mentioning, if we have an employee, whether it's a technician or a BCBA that's found to be deficient in their notes, then they stay on the monitoring um, in, for the next month as well. So we're gonna go ahead and, and look at them again the next month to make sure after the retraining that they are now compliant moving forward. So you need to think about what is the content? How are you going to provide feedback to folks when you do notice and find deficiencies? What is your disciplinary process going to be? Um, you know, is it uh, the first time is correction by email? Uh, at what point, if you're seeing a pattern with the clinician, do you need to involve their mentor or someone higher up? Um, where are you going to document this? Is it just by email? Is it in some um, employee performance management system that you're using? Something to keep in mind with clinical note monitoring. So we, we have a checklist at CAIO that's um, pretty substantial. This is just sort of general information to consider when you're monitoring your notes. So you, there are kind of two acronyms that I've seen related to uh, healthcare note types. One is SOARS and one is SOAP, um, but they're very similar one subject specific or subjective. I don't really love the term subjective. It makes me think of something that's not objective, which I like the subject specific more. Um, if they're objective, observable, they're accurate, they're based on an analysis and assessment of the individual in the moment. They're relevant and re results driven. They involve a plan of action for next steps and they require a signature by the clinician that performed the service. Um, so if it's note specific, what does that mean? For example, a direct therapy session, our technicians must note all of the individuals that are present. They must note the ABA techniques that were used during the session, the goals that were implemented and the patient's response to treatment. Um, if it's a BCBA supervisor, they're also indicating you know, planning, next steps, what's going to happen next in terms of the child's treatment plan. Anything there, Sage, that you wanna add? No, I saw there was um, a question around like the most common deficiency. I think one good thing if you do switch to some type of online system is like Melissa said, we can force a response. So the good news is we will have a response for each of the required fields. So the deficiencies that we see um, are just more like the, the content, you know, they, they need a little maybe coaching and how to talk about um, the caregiver, the caregiver's participation, or how to you know talk about the behaviors that the client engaged in. But luckily, um, you know when when uh, the payers do audit us and we have built our checklist based basically on the checklist they've given us, you know the things that they are checking for are there. So it's helpful. Yeah, no, that's a great question. I'm trying to rack my brain, think back to what were some of those, um, because I, I do know that, that, that still, you know, new staff will have some deficiencies, in particular the new staff um, initially. Maybe that's something that, I don't know, Sage, if um, you have an opportunity while I'm going through this to even just pull up a, one of our check, monitoring checklists, um, but maybe we Yeah, can... I mean, I can tell you the, the parent participation is, and I think this is more of a clinical issue that that's one that, you know, a new BT um, needs a little support to make sure that they're encouraging parents to participate in. Um, and then I would say the other one that we, you know, see the biggest issue is, is really just a tech thing where, where people may be having trouble using the feature that allows them to pull in the data on the goals. Um, but other than that, I think, you know, we've, we've, you know, the fields are required, so you're not able to complete the note without that. And then on top of that, we've added prompts into it. So we're giving like examples of what you might want to write and reminders of what they need to make sure that they um, include. So we've really, you know, in as many ways as possible, made it as um, easy for them to meet the requirements. Here would be an example, and Sage, maybe maybe there are others that you can think of. We can think of one related to supervision notes too, but let's say it's the parent participation section and the technician needs to note 
what did they do? So our techs have to, in every instance of therapy provided, how did they involve the parents at least at some point during the session? And so if the technician were to just put a question mark, let's say, because it's a forced field and it'll allow, once they put something in that field, they can save it and they can convert it. So if they put just XXX or question mark, technically they could convert it. So that would be something that our record monitor would look at and say, oh, you, you actually didn't actually write anything in there. Um, what was it that you did? That does not happen often, but that could happen. Um, or more realistic in terms of something that might happen, they might say something to the effect of, I spoke with dad this morning about what um, Johnny ate for breakfast, right? And um, so they're thinking, well, I talked to the parent and I wrote down what you know I talked to the parent about, but if what Johnny ate for breakfast has nothing to do with one of the goals in the child's treatment plan, that is not what we would consider to be at all, you know, parent training. What we're really looking for is which of the child's goals did you actually involve the parent um, in treatment? Anything else um, on the supervision side? I guess we're starting to run short on time. So we should probably move forward. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're good. Okay, a few minutes on building infrastructure. So monitoring tools and metrics. And before I forget, I'll also take this point, this uh, opportunity to give folks the second keyword for your CEU, and that is Brooklyn. Uh, Sage is not in a barn today. Sage is in Brooklyn. So those are your words, keywords for your CEUs. All right, monitoring tools and metrics. What tools are at your disposal? So many of you, um, you know, everyone has access to low tech. Some of you may be um, working with an agency that has the ability to also use high tech solutions. Um, low tech, of course, is going to involve more of your time, their manual. Um, and, and for some, some monitoring at Cayo, manual processes are fine. If the volume is low enough and these are, uh, monitoring processes that you're engaging in on a less frequent basis, maybe an annual basis, you can use manual in some cases you'll need to use manual um, tools because your uh, data analyst has a long list of more you know, pressing um, needs to build on the high tech side and some of these need to stay, stay manual. So examples at Cayo for sampling um, with low tech would be IEP on file. So we serve a, num a number of, of, of clients with autism who are school district clients. And we need to have a copy of that client's most recent IEP on file at all times. Um, and you'd like to think that this is a, a no brainer. And of course we should always have it, but sometimes you know we are at an IEP and the IEP team member does not send that along afterwards. And um, before long you see that you're out of date and you have last year's IEP, but not this year's IEP and, and your records. So, you could look at that on an annual basis and go through each district funded client's um, file to make sure that the most recent is, is up to date. High tech, we'll give you a couple of examples. Um, we do so much high tech uh, monitoring and thank goodness we have these systems at Cayo because they save so much time, but we've built many, many, many reports that help us to flag and just see with a glance which are instances that are red that require investigation, which are instances that are you know, green, that are clean, um, and, and they don't require um, follow-up. And we do this just across so many different policies in the organization. I'll just, we'll give you a couple of ex quick examples. Um, why, if you're thinking about investing more in technology, why should you um, make the case of, let's say you just have one BCBA on your team and you're working with just four payers and you have eight BTs, and you have 15 clients. Well, that could be 75 clinical events per week, which could be the possibility for thousands of potential rule violations. And so it would be impossible for you to manually keep track of all of these compliance, these instances where the clinicians need to be in compliance. Of course, you multiply this by, um, you know, in our case, we've got over 80 BCBAs, we have a thousand clients, we need technology to help us uh, to do this, this job of compliance monitoring. Here's just a little example of something on the HR side. So we spent a lot of time talking about, um, you know, payers rules today, but there's compliance that your staff need to engage in that 
th th this falls on both for clinical importance and um, HR and, and payroll. So our staff are required to convert their timesheets every within 24 hours. And so we can run a report like this. It'll have the employee's name on the left side. We can filter it by region. Um, and we can see for all the clinical staff, what is their average length of time to convert their timesheets for their sessions. We want quick conversion because payers require it and also for clinical best practices. We wanna make sure that you know, staff aren't entering their notes a week or two after they engaged in that therapy session, we want accuracy of notes. And you know, the most those are gonna be most accurate when they're most immediate. So hopefully the staff, you know, filled it out um, right there during the session. At the end of the day, they're they're converting every day all of their, their session notes. Um, but this would help us to see which staff do we need to follow up with. Another one, um, this would help us to see which clients, which staff need follow-up uh, regarding supervision. So the chart on the left shows us which uh, green represents in compliance with both a payer's minimum requirement for supervision and their maximum requirement for supervision. Um, red means out of compliance with both, I believe there, and then yellow out of compliance with, with one. Is that right, Sage? That's a good question. I think, I so. think it's so, approaching approaching compliance and then out of compliance. But, okay. Yeah. yeah. So um, the you know for that one, if the payer requires, um, let's say they require a minimum of ten percent and a maximum of twenty percent, this could help to provide you with um, you know some indications. And and you you may question, well, why why wouldn't you set twenty one percent then to be out of compliance for us? we maybe will give a little wiggle room because we know that there may be, um, it's just not as worth it to follow up with the BCBAs that for one month went 1% or 2% over or under. But if someone is you know, egregiously under or egregiously over, those are the folks that we need to follow up with first. Um, similarly, there's on parent training on the, uh, the right. So um, let's say you have a payer has a two instances per month or two hours per month parent training minimum. You can build a report like this to show you which clients are receiving, you know, each column being a month, uh, which clients have been receiving that two hour a month parent training and which are, um, you know, which are not, which need follow up. I know that we are running short on time. So I'll try to go through this relatively quickly. Making technology work for you helps to automate collection. Um, you can zero in on risks. You can simplify problem identification and enable self-monitoring by staff. We've got each of our BCBAs has, um, has their own folder within um, our high tech system where they have reports on their own clients and their own behavior and so that they can monitor for compliance um, themselves. We don't have too much time. I'm happy to stay on for a, a few extra minutes. I know some of you will be logging off, but we are absolutely happy to take questions. For those of you who have them, feel free to start to uh, send those off to us. We hope that you found this to be valuable today. Let's see what we've gotten in the chat. <laughs> Ivy, Ivy had a bunch of questions for us today. Thank you, Ivy. Um, are you able to share what your clinic notes look like? If not, I'm curious if your team could give us feedback on how our session notes look. Yeah, um, I think, you know, Sage, is that something that we can just kind of talk folks through um, on the tech side or the supervisor side? Do you have uh, access to just kind of bring one up and talk through the different fields? Uh, yes, I can try to do that. And then I see a question, what was the program or training you attended? So it was through, um, I always forget, the HC Healthcare Compliance Association. So if you look up HCCA, Dot net, I want to say um, they do all sorts of different they do like the compliance academy which was a week long um, they do and then ongoingly they'll send you out you know you can hey attend this on fraud waste and abuse so um, they had they were a great resource especially as I was figuring out what the heck I was doing 
And then also Ivy, um, for folks who want, if you if you you know want to get our thoughts on your session notes, totally happy. If you want to send us an email, um, yeah, know, yeah, that might be easier. Can give you do. feedback. We've had um, we worked with an attorney, uh, Jody Bauer, on uh, clinical notes and, and records years ago, and so we had a lot of great conversations with Jody. Sage and I have presented with Jody um, in the past on this topic and Dan and um, as well. And so, um, you know, we've had legal input on our notes as, and, and so we're happy to, you know, we're not attorneys, but we're happy to provide input just based on what we know to be best practice. Um, email, I can put mine in there, melissa at kyocare.com. And mine, I will write mine as well. It's just sage at kyocare. <laughs> Any other questions from folks? <laughs> Thank you, Ellis. All right, folks. Hope you have a great day. And we have had questions from us in the past from folks who have attended uh, webinars related to compliance. So if anything comes up, don't hesitate. You have our contact information. We're happy to help out. Um, if you have questions related to an audit or other things that you still feel sort of stuck in terms of where to start, we're happy to provide advice. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.